Welcome and good evening. I'm Brandon Morris, the manager of community engagement with Building Our Future. And you are tuning in to Coalition for Dismantling and Racism's Courageous Conversation. Welcome. Welcome to all of our panelists. How are you guys all doing tonight? Excellent. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Good. A part of Kindness Week, the Courageous Conversation. I'm super excited and hopefully all of you viewers out there are excited as well. Hopefully you guys can all hear us. If you can't, please comment in the box below. Uh, we're all being safe and using our masks as well as social distancing. So let's dive right in. Um, again, this conversation is a courageous conversation titled Chaos or Community? How do we move forward? So with the first question, uh, sorry, before we get into questions, I want to introduce our panelists. I apologize. Uh, Dr. Hancock, we'll start with you first. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Michelle Hancock, Vice President of College Culture and Inclusion from Carter College. Good evening. I'm Azina Haywood. I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost at Gateway Technical College. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Gravely. I'm the District Attorney here in Kenosha County. Hi, my name is Meredith Kaufman. I'm a senior at Indian Trail and a co-founder of Equities Kenosha. Hi, my name is Alana Carmichael. I'm also a senior at Indonesia, and I am a co-moderator. Welcome, uh, Jim Cruiser, Kenosha County Executive. Glad to be here tonight. Excellent. Thank you to all your panelists for checking in. Now we can dive into the questions. You can tell how excited, I'm, excited I am to get into the questions. Uh, so thank you guys all again for being here with us and being courageous. Um, Dr. Hancock. To you. Uh, the protest movement has been a part of American society for as long as we can remember. Dr. King led many peaceful protests in the 1960s to bring attention to the racial inequalities that existed here in this country. What do you think was accomplished through this method? Well, when I think about protests, historically, what has sparked protests? in this country has been violence. And most people, I believe, are uncomfortable with violence. So when I think about all the protests that have occurred in this country and where we have gone with that from the women's suffrage movement to uh, the Voting Act rights of 1965 and even King's work, my thing is that we should have peaceful protests because from peaceful protests, we actually gain better support. A coalition of people who are fighting for social and societal, or social and political change. So that's, the, that's how we advocate. So I really believe what has been accomplished is literally changes in our governmental laws and the way we live our lives. Um, let's open up the floor. Anybody else want to add to that? I'd like to add to that. I think those peaceful protests show that there was unity in our society and not just unity in the Black community, because people of all races, creeds, and colors were part of those protests back in the 60s. And I think it also defied the expectation because they expected the riots. They expected you know, those kinds of protests to happen. So I think it really defied expectations as well as show that there could be unity in, in our communities. Uh, and since we have uh, a younger generation uh, on, on this panel, um, 1960s, far, far before you guys were born. Before you guys were born. Um, you guys being young activists, um, you probably did your research on Dr. King and his peaceful protest. You guys led a protest yourselves. Can you guys speak to that and that experience and why it was a peaceful protest? Um, well, when we organized it, it was a little bit hectic. Um, it was a little bit hectic because you, you can never like really know like what to expect. Like, it's never like certain that you know, a fight will break out or you know, like vandalism. Um, and stuff like that. And so when we planned our protest, um, like it was very important to us to be peaceful because when people can understand you, um, they just bring some more respect. And I think that 
that anger and like peacefulness sometimes like we can coexist and like it makes a very very like straight point instead of being like, flustered and angry and like although those are also like valid ways to express your emotions um peaceful protests are just very like they're a very good way to get your point across uh, perspective and merit to you the, the the protests that you guys led back in june of 2020 Obviously, the country was at a, a heightened moment uh, shortly after George Floyd. What was that experience like for you? Um, it was, there was a lot of anger, and rightfully so. And so it was incredibly eye-opening for me because, you know, we're, the, the, since the 1960s has been, you know, at this point, in that in 2020, it had been, uh, I'm going to do math in my head, 60 years. <laughs> I need to go back to school. Virtual learning's gone on too long. Um, there, uh, it's been, it had been 60 years, and there was still this, you know, these same feelings of anger in the air, and it had kind of built up, and it was to the point that, um, you know, how Alana said that peaceful protesting was the way that we thought we could get that, that anger across in a way that would be respected. Um, by people, even if they didn't quite agree with the, the, the points we were trying to make. Um, that was something that was huge for us, was being like, was getting it across so that people who didn't necessarily agree with us could kind of see our point. Because a lot of the time, I think when, you know, there's a lot of anger towards a topic, um, the only way that change can happen is if you can convince people who don't agree with you to start agreeing with you, you know? And that's something that's just incredibly hard to manifest. Um, and it was just kind of like really important to us. I mean, we wanted to do something that would have an impact on our community. Um, and I think that we were successful in some aspects and it's something that I think we're kind of proud of. Yeah. But um, it was something that definitely like, I hadn't seen in the community before and I had never even like, in my worst nightmare, I wouldn't have ever like thought of seeing that in you know Kenosha and then in August of 2020 it kind of expanded past you know a little protest in June of like four girls leading it to an entire community that was angry I'm um, an entire city that was angry and it was just yep. <laughs> that was that's it was just that's really all I can say thank you uh so I also would like uh County exec to weigh in on it again, and, and, I'll, and I'll bring this question back around um, again. What do you think was accomplished through Dr. King's peaceful protest method? Well, I think you have to be sensitized to be sensitive, and when you have a great group of people protesting on an issue with civil discourse and cogent reasoning. People get angry because they don't like what they're hearing and they can't argue against it because it was the right message and it was honed perfectly to create a movement that went far and wide and has lasted it's still going on today obviously but i think that type of dialogue of, of that type of reason getting your point across um, communication is a sender and a receiver if someone's not receiving you're not going to ever change your mind you need to enlighten them and try to get find a way to have access to them. And I think those type of things are, um, when I left the legislature, it was still that way. You could still have a discussion with both sides. And it's really fragmented at the state house in our, in our state um, to a point where they aren't listening to each other at all. There's the common ground, they're dug in. And I think that's a shame because uh, you're wasting a lot of time, energy, and money fighting about things that people say, come on, let's get your job done. That's what I think we should be about trying to focus to say, it's time to get up to the table. Let's, let's address the tough issue. One of the bright spots about all this is seeing young people involved again. And that is the future. And I think it's worth noting that the young professionals that we've hired are really internal champions of this whole change. Uh, over the past three or four years, they've embraced it. Um, if somebody says something inappropriate, they'll say, that's hurtful, just like that. And all of a sudden, everybody has a different disposition. All right, 
now we're now we're having a good discussion now because we're being honest with people and i think that's been just a really good culture in county government that we've been able to nurture that and nip things in the butt thank you sir you yeah so um you know the the, uh, the power of this that, that maybe we've touched on but haven't really covered is is that you know one of the things that it certainly revealed was that there are a lot of people in this community for a variety of reasons that felt disenfranchised right they didn't feel like they had a real role in in sort of the powers that controlled their lives whether it be policing or government or whatever and and you know this protest movement allowed a lot of people who felt disenfranchised to feel the franchise in a way that that has some power to it and, and and that the potency of that you know i think is uh has an energy to it that can accomplish change um i'm not sure there's ever been a time in my life um that it's been harder to change people's minds because we have the capability because of the modern world to live in silos right where we only watch media that we want, you know, that agrees with us. We can we can go to school with only people who agree with us. We can we can control almost all the, the alternative sources of information. And my goodness, the protest didn't allow people to live in that silo in the same way, right? It, it caused discomfort in all the ways that that can be a positive force. And so, you know, from my perspective, there's a real power to that. It's important for people out there who are watching and hearing this to know what we're talking about, though, is we're talking about peaceful protest, right? Because the moment that this protest becomes unpeaceful, the moment it's a it's it's a riot or it has violence or destruction to it, that is backlash time, right? So that's when people who are in silos have all their beliefs reinforced. And so, you know, there's that really fine line that you guys are talking about when you talk about, you know, your fears about, you know, uh, creating something that's really a a positive thing. So, you know, everyone who's spoken so far on this panel to this issue is talking about the nonviolent folks who got together and really tried to have a say for a few weeks in this town and, and what a powerful force that could still be. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brandon. We, can you please share with our, our viewers uh, your, your name and, and your title? Okay. Um, my name is Brandon Wheat. I'm the first minister of the Fifth for Kenosha Corps. Uh, community organizer resolution. I'm filling in for Minister Khalif. He has found emergency. Um, basically, what what we are here to do is to try to create a common ground amongst the community and the powers that be. You know, flexible communication is no longer in existence. That's why so much division amongst the community, uh, the people that live within, and the people that push the powers within. Mm -hmm. So we're just basically here to try to make sure that the community has a voice as opposed to trying to protest. You know, there's nothing wrong with protest. Protest is sometimes creates a reason for communication, as you was just saying. With the protesting, it allows a voice that's been um, smothered to be heard and visions to be seen that haven't been seen. So we're just basically trying to be the peacemakers of it all. You know, we're trying to make sure that we create a dialogue amongst the community and the authorities so we can have that, that family knit again, like it used to be, where um, the officers used to be able to ride in the neighborhoods and speak to the kids and the kids would speak back to them and give them a little lollipop or a little sheriff's badge, a little sticker thing. And right now, the community really isn't trusting the powers because of certain things that may have went and happened that they weren't in agreement to. So we're just here just to bring some type of positive vibe. Uh, thank you and, and welcome again. Uh, on to the next question. President Lyndon B. Johnson created the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders to explore the root causes of the 1960s unrest and riots. <clears throat> the task force released the Kerner Commission's report in 1968. The report regarded white racism as the tender igniting the 1960s riots and stated that police violence against people of color incited the riots, riots more than any other factor. 52 years later, Kenosha experienced a series of protests that gave way to three nights of violence in the aftermath of a police shooting 
of our of Jacob Blake, a black man. What can we do moving forward, moving upstream? What can we do to heal our community and further the connections between diverse community members, particularly blacks and other people of color? Again, back to you, Dr. Hancock. Well, I, you know, we have building our future. We have organizations here in Kenosha that are trying to move us forward and bring people together. But one of the things I think a community has to do is that we need to define what really is racial equity, what it means, uh, how it can be used. Because I think if we reach racial equity, we can no longer say that based on our race that we don't have access. Mm. And, and so the goal to me is that for all people to come together. And I think we need to understand how we look at individual, institutional, and structural racism. Now, there are tools today that we didn't have 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's been research, there's been organizations, community organizations. So to me, what needs to happen is that we need to really set some clear, defined outcomes about what we want to achieve in this community. And particularly, we need to involve Black and people, other people of color in the conversations. And they need to be ongoing conversations that is defined with data and actions that we can take. And we need to determine the benefits in every organization in Kenosha. What are we, what, how are we benefiting all people and what is the burden we have placed on all people because of the policies and practices that exist? And once we have done that, we need to say we are willing to advance opportunity and minimize harm to the very people who need support the most. If we do not have access the way we need to have access, not just in this community, but across the country. So in my mind, it takes everyone's responsibility of all the different organizations that exist in this community to come together with BIPOC people and really have a genuine, authentic communication process in place so we can define the actions that we wanna take to really see progress here in Kenosha? Uh, to you, same question. Uh, what can we do moving forward, like moving upstream to heal our Kenosha community? Yeah, I think that focusing on the topics that like cause like the root of you know, division, mm -hmm. you know, colonialism, like mm -hmm. pretty much breeded colorism. Mm -hmm. And so like when you talk about different ethnicities, different people of color, you also have to like acknowledge the fact that between like us, there's also, you know, things that we have to work on because, you know, like black people, they get it from like every side. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can really like communicate with each other, um, not only in a way that'll like help everybody, but also make people understand like educating like ourselves on different cultures, mm -hmm. knowing people who are like, good sources on that education, that's just super important um, to just bring everybody together and like an area that is safe for us to talk about issues like that. Uh, so again, another young voice. Mira, I gotta bring it to you. What's something tangible for those that are listening? What could they do moving forward here in our Kenosha community to heal? There are so many opportunities to get involved in hurting communities right now. Um, I'll be the first to say that I haven't come to as many Building Our Future meetings as I wish I would have this year. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, an action commitment I definitely wanna make in the future to start going. But there are communities like, they're, they're Building Our Future is a great place mm -hmm. to start closing education gaps. They I mean, the first place you can heal our community is with, is with children, with young children, mm -hmm. and making sure that they have equal opportunities I mean, there's equal opportunity acts out there that you can you can go to legislative levels, and I completely and totally think that they have had waves of impact. But until we go to the individual student and help them get to the same level as we have students in other member like in other places in our communities that those opportunities are handed to them, until we hand all children those same opportunities, 
there's no healing in our community because we're going to have generation upon generation of generational trauma of the prison, the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it is generational. And until we go to every, every student from K to 12 in this community and hand them opportunities they wouldn't have been handed otherwise, I don't know how that's going to happen. But as community members, you kind of have to look at that and say, okay, what is here already? What could I do that opportunities that are here already that I can go better my community, better communities that I don't, maybe I don't live in that community, but I live in the Kenosha community. Where can I go to better where I live? Speaking on education, and we have educators <laughs> in the room, <laughs> <laughs> what can we do moving forward to heal our community? Merritt spoke to education, you being an educator. What can we do to help heal our community in that space? There's a lot of things we can do related to education. First of all, um, of course, this comes, I'm speaking my bias right now. We need to dispel the, uh, the thought that a two year technical education is lesser than a uh, four year and above education. For the people and way in the back on Facebook, <laughs> way in the back on Facebook. Did you say that again? Yes, I will say it loud. That's right. <laughs> We need to dispel uh, the myth that a two-year technical <laughs> education is not as good as a four-year education, doesn't lead to the same income levels, does not support uh, family sustaining wages, and they actually do. In okay. fact, a report just came out a couple of days ago from the technical college system in uh, 2020. It talked about something uh, that we totally forgot about, which is apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. An apprenticeship is a wonderful way uh, for to present opportunities. We even have, there are even junior apprenticeships in high school, in junior uh, and senior years where students are working as well as learning about the profession still in high school. And when you get to an apprenticeship at the technical college level, you are working while you're learning about your profession. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, the study from 2020, it said that, uh, that the median uh, wage for apprentices coming right out of apprenticeship is $80,000. Mm -hmm. That's the median. That means that's half or more than that, but half or less than that. And the, the median for uh, apprentices coming from welding programs, the median is $114,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So there are some myths out there that we really need to start to dispel to understand that there are ways to, to get that uh, family sustaining wage. Mm -hmm. but we also need to support programs and federal initiatives like free two-year college. Mm -hmm. That's been talked about for years now. Yeah. And we've tried to do a little bit of that on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. At Gateway, we have the Gateway Promise where students can come and get their uh, three years of education mm -hmm. at Gateway, but we, need, we can do so much more. Uh, to you, the first Minister of Defense. Yes. <laughs> Something <laughs> tangible at the community level, the grassroots level. What can folks out there do to help heal the community moving forward? Communication. That's the very first step. You have to go to the communities that are affected by the division, by the separatism, by the, the biasness. You have to be willing to go inside the communities, even though you may not reside there, especially if you are a person of stature in the community. Be willing to go knock on the door. I know it's going to look strange, which a stranger knocking on your door, but just go knock on the door and ask questions. Ask what it is that we can do to make you feel comfortable or wanted in the community. And you have to be willing to understand that when they took trades out of high school, that's when a lot of things changed in all communities, especially the black community. I think we need to go ahead and, and, and implement those trades back into the high schools, whether it, whether it be plumbing, welding, carpentry, something. Get the kids interested in something that's gonna be productive for them at an early stage in life so once they do become of mature status, they have a better understanding of what it is and what it's gonna take for them to be a productive citizen. And I believe that it's gonna take for us to go and tell 
what's available. Mm -hmm. Let the resources be known. Let the resources be heard. See, a lot of people don't know about all the things that are readily available for everybody that's out there, especially in the community. So I feel that if we go and we start broadcasting it, like, hey, we got these services at the job center, we got these services at the health department, we have these services, such, 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 and such, then people can have a clear idea of what it is that they can go and attain. If you don't know, you won't know. So I feel like we got to communicate a whole lot better. And uh, I would like both of you guys to weigh in to wrap up this question. Um, in your positions, something tangible that the everyday community, uh, Kenosha community resident could do moving forward to heal the community. So can I change the question slightly? Uh, that's what lawyers do, of course. Right? <laughs> uh, stop me if you want to. But, uh, you know, I, I want to speak to how the criminal justice system can be uh, sort of uh, affirmative in that healing process. Because so much of what we, you know, what people were on the streets about had criminal justice as a flavor to it, right? Yeah. So, so you know, I, I envision um, us really demanding of our police that they interact with the communities that they directly impact in ways that are much more profound, right? So if you think about uh, police, and this is true of the DA's office too, engaging with folks um, only when shots are fired or if somebody they care about is being put in handcuffs, right? So, you know, how do we have police engage in real and profound ways in neighborhoods where those aren't the only levels of engagement they have. And, and you know, how do you do the same with the DA's office so that the only time we're engaging with certain folks in this community are not when they are either the victims directly of crime or when they are watching me, you know, describe somebody they care about, you know, and saying they should go to prison, right? So, you know, that that is the task that really is a, is, is a must for the criminal, for people in the criminal justice system like my folks. You know, we, one of the things we do is we, um, Pre-COVID, uh, were you know had a really active mentoring program uh, at Brass School, where yeah. where I was demanding that my staff you know interact with children from that community in ways so that we felt the human cost of every charging decision we made, right? Of every moment we were in a courtroom, we we knew the kids personally who were impacted by those decisions. Um, you know, I, I'm a person who spent a lot of time in office speaking about you know to employers about um, making jobs available to the previously incarcerated, right? You know, why is a DA doing that? A DA is doing that because that's public safety, right? That is speaking to people where they really live, where you can impact a family at the dinner table in a community that I don't get to touch every day, you know? So, so all of those efforts, you know, we, we need to demand of the police and the DA's offices, the judges, everybody, you know, where are you out in the community on a day that you're not sending somebody to prison or locking somebody up? You know, how are you out in the community in those other days? And, you know, to me, that's, that is how you start to heal. You have real relationships with people, real conversations. Once upon a time in Kenosha, the old model of policing was almost every cop in this town was somebody who grew up here. So one of the things that, that, that there was some advantage to in that was if you went to the door of some house in a neighborhood, you went to high school with that guy. You, you knew his mom, right. you know, and all that. Yeah. And, and that created a different relationship when you came to their door than we have right now. And, you know, so, so we've lost that and we gained some education in our cops. There's some real positive reasons why we did that. But, you know, we have to figure out ways to, to replace that. And, and I, I really think that's a huge key to having the criminal justice system be more human in all sorts of ways and have people who are on the receiving end of it, you know, uh, believe it and understand. Wrapping up this question. Oh, excuse and, me, and, I wanted to just jump in. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, you, doctor. Oh, you know, yeah. That is absolutely, thank you for saying that. But I also, I'm gonna go back to the statement about the school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. because the educational system in this country and in Kenosha needs to change how we look at young people right. and how we deal with them within the school system. And when you have police officers in schools and they make the determination 
that when a student has done something that is, you know, uncomfortable or not the right thing, the first knee jerk reaction is to, for that, for the staff or anyone to call cops in and then treat the children like criminals. That's not helping our society. So we have that school to prison pipeline throughout the country, but it's definitely here. And Mike and I have had conversations about this, sure. about the school to prison pipeline. Yeah. And I'm very concerned that that still exists and it has not changed to the level that it needs to change in the way in which our schools treat our students. And when our students are in a crisis, how do we look at them from, not from a deficit, like what's wrong with them, but how can we help them? It should be more about helping young people, not condemning them all the time for mistakes that they make in schools. And if you will, I want to piggyback off of what she just said. That's one of our mission statements in Kenosha Core. We're, we're currently trying to get into the high schools. So at least two of us, if not one of us, are on location at every school so we could talk to the kids if they're, you know, we see, if we set some tension going on, we could pull them to the side, talk to them before the authorities have to come and intervene. We want to be able to make sure that the kids feel like there is a big brother without being their big brother and don't have to worry about being locked up because they don't know how to control their emotions. They don't know how to communicate their emotions through actions. So that's one of the main things that Kenosha Corps is here for. We're trying to get into high schools and junior high schools and prevent that so the kids don't have to visit that school to prison pipeline. Thank you for that. We're wrapping up with this question. Uh, like you to close it out for us, County Exec. Um, what could the Kenosha community do? Something tangible that folks can do to heal moving forward. First point I'm going to bring up is Gateway Technical College. Absolutely, you can get a living wage coming right out of there. As a matter of fact, people don't even finish your programs and they're getting That's hired true. away from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. I do. Well, talking well, to the children, <laughs> say, if we don't do something quick and get our young men and women starting at middle school to get them sensitized so they're sensitive to get a career in this right. and let them out of high school and go right to the trades if they want, which is the old way it used to be. I think when old should be new again in the trades, we're going to have a problem when our college doesn't flush and no one shows up for a while because that aging demographic is going way down if you take a look at that. Electrical, heating, all the building trades. So I think that is a big area. What can we immediately do? If someone wanted to help the healing right now, they should call Building Our Future. They should tutor someone. I don't care if it's once a month, if they can do once every two weeks, if they can take an hour, whenever they can do it, to touch a young person's life, to give them a different perspective, to give them hope or have them figure out a problem. I think the mentoring programs that go on here are successful. They need to be more emboldened and people shouldn't be afraid because it will be a win-win. And the conduits that we all create, uh, we have a lot of talk. We need to have people of with great diversity at the table making these plans and neighborhood driven or school driven. And maybe you can't do it all in one, all in everywhere at one time. But then start out somewhere and do it well, and then Indeed. replicate. Indeed. Um, because if you never begin, you'll never get it done. And I'd like to say about the mentoring that it is actually a critical action that we should all take in this community. And I want to mention that because we need to get more BIPOC, Black, Indigenous people of color, more involved in mentoring programs or mentoring activities. And I would like to say that at Carthage, we have done that. We have reached out to our Black alumni and they have answered the call to support our students at Carthage College to help them navigate the college experience. And I think that's the critically important, the diversity of the mentoring programs and bringing in diverse people to really support students. And you 
and you can get plugged in as a mentor right now. Right. That's something anybody can do right now. Mm -hmm. Invest that time. Excellent. So those of you guys that are tuning in or just joining us on Facebook, uh, this courageous conversation is brought to you by the, the Coalition for Dismantling and Racism, and it's titled Chaos or Community, How Do We Move Forward? So moving into the next question, um, reflecting on the last two years, do you think things have gotten better or worse in our community? And why do you think it's better or worse? Uh, the Minister of Defense, we're going to start with you. Again, you're at the ground level. What do you think? Um, we were just at the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial, and you know there was a lot of protesting going on. But by us being readily available, we prevented fights. We prevented chaos from kicking off and acting off. So I feel that, no, Kenosha has gotten worse over the last two years. And, mm -hmm. and I'm being honest. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm on the front line. I'm in the streets where we are uh, as a whole and as a collective. So we're seeing certain things that people only see the ending story or the ending results of. So we've, man, just, just in one year's time period, we've, we've, um, reported to at least 75 incidents in the city of Kenosha, including hostage situations, including murders, including shootings. It's, it's, it's chaotic, but at the same time, it's controllable because we want it to be controlled. We are willing to sacrifice our self-being to make sure that things become more peaceful, more um, acceptable, because we're sitting back and we're watching communities become more and more separate. You know, it's, it's not the family knit that most of us grew up, grew up around or understood as a child. So I feel that chaos is, I mean, crime is getting, it's getting out of hand, but that's only because people aren't being given choices and opportunities that they can see. See, we all know that there are certain things out there that are available so people can have alternative to doing crime and criminal activity. But I feel that if we communicate, like I was saying, and we put it out there, it can become a deterrent and make people really think and see things before they act because it's more emotional reactions as opposed to logical reactions right now. To you, DA, I'm sure there's a lot of data that's been pulled over the last two years, and there's a lot of things that come to, to your desk. Has Kenosha, our Kenosha community that we all love, has it gotten better or worse, and why? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you wanted to look at something as raw and clear cut as, as the number of homicides, right? Um, I think last year, Kenosha probably set a record for the number of homicides uh, in, in the county. Uh, now that reflected a national trend. You know, that was, I think Chicago set a record as well, I believe yeah. Milwaukee. So, so we're not, you know, we're not a, uh, you know, we're not a unicorn in that respect, but uh, it, it feels to me like gun violence has, uh, has really uh, increased uh, in town and that, um, and that uh, there are uh, profound disconnects between the, the world of law enforcement and the criminal justice system and certain communities that are directly impacted by that gunfire. And, you know, so that that is, to me, that doesn't appear to have gotten better. Um, so I, I would say that's worse. Uh, there's a lot of people on the ground who are trying to work on that. I think that the new police chief has you know, started to talk about violence interrupters and, and a number of strategies that I'm hopeful about. I think there are, there are conversations going on in the community that I'm hopeful about too. Um, you know, I, was, uh, I had a jury trial this last week, right? It was six days, three young men were killed and I did the jury trial and they're all raised in Kenosha guys who are deceased. Uh, about 75 of their family members and friends were all, for all six days of the trial. And um, I talked to them at every break. So I talked to them about four times a day. 
and you know worked hard on the case really thought I was you know uh, being of service to them and one of the things that was really enlightening to me um, and you know teaches me a lesson again is those 75 people had absolutely no faith the criminal justice system was going to serve them you know they did not come into that room believing the criminal justice system was stood for them and that people like me were there for them in that moment and I hope they ended the six days by feeling that way, but um, it was surprising to me the level of disconnect in that room about that. And you know that's something that that I need to wrestle with because that shows what the chasm is. You know, so there's a lot of work to do. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're better off right now. Uh, there's plenty of work to do. The one thing I'm hopeful about is you know when you have that period of chaos like we clearly did. Uh, you have more receptive minds towards change than you ever will otherwise. So to me, there are opportunities there. Um, so as I prepare to ask the young folks, I kind of cringe and, and become emotional because these are our future. So reflecting over the last two years, and we want to hear from both of you, what do you guys think? Has Kenosha gotten better or worse and why? I think honestly, in there, it's <laughs> worse, and I'm going to explain. Um, when I was, I was really closely watching the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, and I know I can't look at one isolated event as reflective of two years of um, of this city's progress, but watching a jury of that was reflective of our entire community unanimously decide that you know, if you decide that you're going to go armed to a protest, it can be called self-defense, was just incredibly disheartening um, going forward into um, adulthood. <laughs> um, because, you know, anyone watching that, I mean, it globally, or but more importantly, nationally and locally, anyone who decides that they don't agree with the contents of a, of a peaceful protest, they, um, even, you know, or a protest in general can decide that they can fire their, fire their weapon into a crowd. Um, that's just disheartening because like, as gun violence rises and, you know, I feel a little bit less safe, you know, driving, driving anywhere in the city. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, of course, like, my mom tells me stories about how her mom just said to be home before the street lights turned out. But, you know, I'm told that I should probably lock my car doors in a dark parking lot even before the streetlights go off, like, or in the middle of the day. Like, it's just disheartening because, you know, I think that we, for me, protesting during the summer of 2020 was unity. I wanted unity. I wanted to come together and I wanted people to see what I, what I saw, you know. But after that trial, so that specific trial, I didn't, I saw division as I'd never seen it before. I turned on my phone and I saw people on both sides. One side was celebrating and one side was just absolutely disheartened. And, you know, obviously I see um, the younger perspective on a lot of that. And it was just kind of really disheartening to see just so much hurt and anger. Um, and as, you know, younger people get a lot more political, um, I think, and I was just talking to my grandma today and she said, when I was in high school, we didn't even think about politics. That was not a thing that they really considered very much. They didn't know their friends' political parties. There's even some division in like the school in political, in politicalness. And it's just, I think it's got so much worse after, you know, in the last two years. And I think that's kind of, like I said, it's just disheartening. I also agree. I believe it's gotten worse. I, um, specifically in our high school, there's uh, like two very distinct sides. And, you know, very often you just, it's like mostly just like blatant, like it's, there's like become, it's become like a normal to just hear casual racism in the hallways and to just know, avoid these people because they're racist. It's, it's almost like a free for all for like everything. And you would think it would like create some sort of like open communication, but instead it just like, you like hunger down on like your beliefs whatever like if you know the opposing side you don't talk to them you go near them like it's very split and as for like the Kyle Rittenhouse um situation I remember coming into my sixth period class and everybody was dead silent and 
they do know that like I'm very active in like you know um and you know the Black Lives Matter movement they know that and so when my teacher had to like tell me like nobody wanted to tell me nobody wanted to tell me and so I like had to ask my teacher she said yeah like not guilty and like you could just see it like in everybody's faces how something just felt different like this was different like now like like she said you can you know like shoot into a, a peaceful protest into a maybe not as not so peaceful protest but either way that's still human life and I think like along with it getting worse you you lose the value of human life like you people like stop thinking of other people as you know people and they start seeing them as whether you're with them or against them and as long as that like mindset is there like nothing will ever get better but you know, I think the race baiting by the politicians in America has just exacerbated the racism. And all of what we're talking about this evening, the, um, the current of it that's driving it is race and racism. And so that has the politicians using that as a dividing tool, they're being very successful at this right now. The country is divided. Kenosha is divided. We are divided. And so you have right now where I think it's worse in Kenosha because of that very reason. And what I would like to see happen and well, how I think it could get better is that we really begin to examine. Mike, when you said that you were surprised about how those 75 Black people felt about the judicial system not being there for them. That is something that has been known and existed in the African-American community since the beginning of time in this country, looking at our history. So one of the things that has to happen is that we have to begin to tell the truth about, you, about the U.S. and the history around race and racism and what it has done. To this country and what it continues to do to our communities. And that's why it's worse. I think any country that refuses to acknowledge what truly has happened over our 400 years and how certain people have been marginalized and oppressed, we're going to continue not to really solve what we really need to solve for this country. I think we could take a page out of Germany and how after the Holocaust, they literally make sure that their citizens are well educated about what occurred because they don't want it to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And my greatest fear right now is that there was a time that I believed that America was on the right path. We always struggled. There was a, there's a journey to be had. We gotta fight for what's right. But I never dreamed that in the 21st century, as an educator, as a mother, as a grandmother, that I will be fearful of my children's lives. I served this country, my husband served this country, but yet and still, when that protest happened here, and I was getting calls saying people were marching and they have guns in the street, and I wasn't afraid of Black people because I know we can't carry weapons like that. But I was afraid in my own community, the community I live in right now, I am afraid. And it's not right. I shouldn't have to live in fear of my children. I shouldn't have to be, live in fear of me and my husband. Because if we go into a restaurant here at Kenosha, you can see, you, White men sitting down with guns in restaurants. That is fearful to me. It's fearful for, I feel, many people who are non-white. So I think things are worse, but I also am always hopeful because I believe there's so many good people in the world that we can't lose sight, that we just have to continue the good fight. And that good fight is recognizing that we have to be educated on the historical impact of racism in this country. Thank you. And if you will, just, just look at it. Um, a lot of people don't understand that a person of color, no matter if you're 
African American, Hispanic, or whatnot. Before you walk out that house, you have a lot of fights to fight in order to get back to that house. And a lot of people don't really understand that when you are a person of color, you have to fight racism, you have to fight prejudice, you have to fight separatism, you have to fight oppression, you have to fight all things that make you feel less than humane. And that's why a lot of the mothers that's in the communities are fearful of their sons and their daughters when they walk out the door because there's no telling that they're going to come back to that door, whether it's through death or jail. And because of those things and because of that fear, it creates panic, it creates chaos, it creates nervousness that is only treated through medicine and, 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 and some type of uh, physicians or psychiatrists and a lot of people of color don't like to get mental health. So therefore, the, 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 the hate and the anguish overcomes them. So when they do see a person of authority, they view them as the enemy. Because most people of color are, are, are spoken and treated as two thirds a human, one third an animal. So they are afraid to be a human because when they sit up there and say, don't you see I'm a man just like you, I'm a woman just like you, the other person that's staring in their eyes is saying, no, I don't see that. And they may not be saying it verbally, but their actions is saying it. So that's, 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 that's something serious that she was just talking about. So yeah, man, it's, it's hard to be a person of color in America right now. So um, when you guys are speaking about racism, I, I want to challenge all of our viewers, as, as well as you guys, if you haven't already, there's a book that's, that's been said, it's for every American. And I would challenge everyone to read this book. It's by the author, Heather McGee, and it's The Sum of Us, What Racism Cost Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. So for all of our viewers and, and every one of us that's in the room, if you haven't read that book already, I would challenge everyone to read that book. Uh, moving on to the next question, we wanna hear from um, uh, County Exec and Dr. Haywood. So I recognize that all of you, all of us are from different sectors, whether you're students, officials, higher education, community members, what have you done over the last year in your company, your agency, organization around creating a more inclusive and welcoming environment? Just name one or two that you're proud of. County Exec, we'll start with you and then hey, we'll come. Um, we had a declaration on racism as a public health crisis. That came out several weeks before the Jacob Blake shooting. The amount of calls that were angry, stunning, stunning. And the emails were just, how could you do this? This is crazy. Which made me feel it was something we should have done a long time ago. Um, the creation of a uh, racial and ethnic equity commission. Um, created an internal diversity task force within the county to take a look at our, our system. Created an uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion office of position, which became a controversial issue of all things. And ultimately passed by the county board, which gives me faith in the system. But many of you were there to give support to that. And that's what it needs to be. Um, we also added, and I'm just going on longer than my time, but uh, Martin Luther King Day and Juneteenth Day is county holiday. Um, talk about a lot of things. We wanted to do a lot of things by action. And I think in this past year we've done that, but there's a lot of work we have to do. So I get this question off, and I guess it's best to hear from you. What exactly, and maybe, it, it may take too long, but when you say declaring racism as a public crisis, what, what exactly does that mean? 
morbidity rates are higher for African Americans. Access, uh, afraid to have access. We need to do more outreach. Um, we attempted to move the Human Service Building into a neighborhood for better service. We're now going to do that in a different neighborhood. I think that's going to be great for premium walking distance, so that a lot of these healthcare issues can be dealt with immediately in a neighborhood that would actually serve clientele. Um, and I, I, I think those are the steps we need to be doing. Um, does everybody have equal access to healthcare? Absolutely not. Um, we've been going into various neighborhoods and treated wonderfully and with great appreciation for getting uh, vaccine shots and information on WIC programs and Head Start, Head, all, all the food shares, which have gone up 20%. When you say, are things better over the last two years? You know, just put a bright light on something. It doesn't look as good. But are, we, are there a lot of headwinds going in the other direction? I think there's positive things. Positive things are going forward, but it's, it's work in progress again. Uh, and so I think we're making a lot of positive progress. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we've done a, a few things at Gateway Technical College. Uh, one is we also started an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And uh, another thing that we have done is a part of that office is create a, a statement on uh, diversity for the college. And that don't, doesn't only just state what our values are, but what we expect from students, what the behaviors, the respect uh, that we expect everyone to happen and it, and it implies that we are watching that and we are making sure uh, that that is going to happen. We also, uh, in summer of 20, we started a mandatory uh, first year experience course. A lot of colleges and universities have those courses, but the first time we've ever had one in, at Gateway. And one of the modules is uh, what we call citizenship. And in that citizenship module, we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. We tell our students and it's mandatory your first semester. So they know right away. So they can't say, I didn't know uh, that this was unacceptable. We explain what's acceptable, what's not uh, acceptable uh, at the college. So that's a, another big thing that we're doing to combat racism on campus. We also offered, um, last summer, we offered some uh, crucial conversations or about around civ civic dialogue that was open to the community on various topics. And then we had a good response from the community uh, with those workshops. One of the, um, I think, most significant things that we did uh, within the last year or two was offer uh, fair and impartial policing training. And we offered that training to uh, police officers uh, and all the, the agencies uh, in our district for the officers. We offered it to the chiefs, the, the command, uh, parts of, uh, of those agencies. And we also had a community and command session where we invited the community to sit down with police chiefs to say, how does this happen? How do you hire police officers? What happens? And we, we saw videos and we had a national trainer uh, to come in and talk to the community uh, and, and, the, and the sit down with the, uh, the police chiefs to actually talk about what's going on. So we've been doing a few things uh, to, to help fight racism uh, in our community. So I, I got to follow up with that, offering that type of thing to the community where you're sitting down with the police chiefs or police officers and asking about how do they hide. How important is that for we as you know, regular everyday citizens that don't know that? How important is that to get that on a broader scale? And how do we do that? That it is important to get that on a broader scale. And we tried to do some of that. We've done some train the trainer. Uh, with this uh, national uh, leader uh, in this in this field, and so all of our um, police academy and law enforcement instructors have gone through this training, and so now it's a part now it's a part of our curriculum in our police academy, and so we're, we're trying to move it out as, as best we can. I think we're going to look at trying to offer some more of those sessions to give more the community to sit down um, with the police chief to understand. And when you understand where someone is coming from and how things operate, they talked about laws and policies and, and our staff could talk about training, what happens in the training that we do. It's, it's, it's enlightening and it gives you a different perspective uh, when things happen. Uh, with the time that we have left, I, I'm gonna ask this question and I wanna hear from everyone. 
And again, to the viewers, if you guys are just joining us, you are in for uh, an amazing treat hearing from, mm -hmm. from these folks in a courageous conversation. Uh, this conversation being titled uh, Chaos or Community, How Do We Move Forward? Uh, so this question here, I, I want to hear from all of you. Uh, County Exec, we'll, we'll start with you and, and First Minister, Minister of Defense. We'll let you close it off. Gotcha. Um, how do we nurture a sense of hope that includes action in Kenosha? I'd like to start off a lot of my presentations with everyday great things happen in Kenosha County. And they do. We have internal champions throughout our community. Uh, we have, when the civil unrest happened, we have people coming out, donating. We have people painting uh, plywood, putting them up. People actually creating stronger neighborhoods, neighborhood watches. Um, helping each other. It's been an isolated time these past couple of years, but there have been times, many times, that people have come together, shot for elderly people. Um, I guess the hope is, hopefully you can get it, open up that crust on some of these people and get at their hearts so they start listening and loving thy neighbor. Um, we we got to start trying to get along. We can be, dis we can disagree. In this room, we may have disagreements, but we're not disagreeable. And that's the point we have to get to. Communication solves a lot of community issues. And communicating that goes on with all these professionals here and these young people who have great potential, which is the future. Um, I'm hopeful for the future, because I'll tell you, the young people continue to shock me, and they shouldn't, because they're very talented. They've got ideas. and. Uh, they got a little more energy in some ways. <laughs> Alana, to you, how do we nurture a sense of hope that includes action in Kenosha? I think one of the biggest things that I saw um, firsthand was like volunteering. I think part of that is like not only do people like want to get like have to like want to get help, people have to like want to help. And I think like something that might turn people away is that they're uncomfortable like in these neighborhoods that aren't like theirs. And I think that part of like that uncomfortability, it can spark like conversation, it can spark a uh, community. Like you come, whether you're volunteering at like a food drive or you're just like at a park and you know, you're playing with the kids or you know, you're donating your time to like tutoring and stuff like that. And like those, it's not like a bad uncomfortable, it's just different. And I think that when you experience things that like you would never like, on your own, you have to go out and do it. I think that's like, that's where you learn. Like that's where your knowledge of other cultures, that's where your knowledge of like smaller communities within your own community, like that's where it comes from. And I think hope like comes like really easily when people are willing to just step outside their mouths a little bit. I completely agree. I think like some of my, like my best life experience came from you know, volunteering in a community that wasn't my own. And um, like when, when, you know, protests were over in August of 2020, kind of turned into September of 2020, we kind of saw a loss in the amount of people that wanted to go out and do something. And that's, I think that we need that back again without some major life event happening. Mm -hmm. You know, we need people to have that drive 24 seven for change to happen. So where does that drive come from, you know? Like, mm -hmm. Um, I like personally, I love, you know, I love working with kids and I love going to Brass Community School. Um, like, uh, the EOC Outreach Center does a, a summer camp for uh, youth at Brass Community School. And like, again, my best life experiences, I saw a kid do a backflip into a kangaroo exhibit. Like, you know, <laughs> that is something that I've never ever seen ever again in my whole life. It was terrifying. But I mean, it was life experience. And I mean, it's something that you have to seek out. And so why aren't we seeking that out anymore? What can we do to seek that out? Why aren't we going to the Shalom Center and donating our Friday night? You know, why aren't we bringing cans to, you know, people who are hungry? 
Why are we not going and seeing the person who hasn't ate on the street for a week and bringing them food? What can we, where can we find that drive as a community to do these things every day? Okay. Let's get a 60 second timer so we don't run out of time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to you, EA. How do we nurture a sense of hope here? Yeah, so, you know, uh, on a personal level, this is a tough one for me because uh, the DA's office has made some really challenging decisions in the last 18 months. And uh, the dividers in this country uh, spent a lot of time uh, uh, threatening death to people at the DA's office and uh, saying some really horrible things at the DA's office. And, and, and I had to come to the conclusion that was really about trying to stifle conversation, right? If you threaten somebody's life or if you... If you swear at them and stuff, you're trying to make sure no conversation occurs. And so, you know, the cost of not being hopeful is that the dividers win. Uh, and then, you know, the vision in the, in the other end is, uh, you know, if we have these conversations and do this tough work, think about how Kenosha has been portrayed nationally and think about the potential to have a really a learning experience for the whole nation if we can have some success. So that's where I think about it. Yeah. I think to show hope, we have to show more positive things that are happening in our community. It's been such a spotlight on the bad things and we gotta do more positive stories. We have to focus more on similarities and differences. I think those types of things can help. I think also when we see um, people that reflect us in authority, that look like me in authority, whether it's elected office, whether it's the police officer. So diversity in, those places of authority, I think, are really going to give us hope that things are going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think also when we're thinking about um, city and county and big uh, citywide or countywide initiatives, that everybody's brought to the table to talk about that and what's best for uh, the communities that we're trying to help. They know better than, than we do about those kinds of situations. So rather than we're talking about bringing those kind of folks together, it's not people like in this panel. We're talking about people who are on the street. We talk to them about what they need and try to look at look at things from their perspective. They'll have hope that they actually, uh, people who can make a difference are actually listening to what I really need. And that will give people hope that things will change. And I still agree with you yeah. about positionality mm -hmm. in terms of leadership and throughout organizations, seeing BIPOC people in all types mm -hmm. of leadership roles and in jobs where they are making a sustainable living mm -hmm. for their families. But I also think of hope in the sense of what I'm currently doing and working in Carthage. I've been at Carthage College for seven years and it has truly been a beacon of hope for me. I, you know, I keep working because I'm seeing change and I feel like I'm part of that change. And so when I think of hope and action, I think about what Carthage has done in the past seven years I've been there and just promoting me to a vice president, number one, for campus culture and inclusion. That's, that's meaningful. But more than that, in terms of action, Carthage has literally the general education curriculum. We had an 80% vote out of our faculty to include the requirement for diverse perspectives. We now have a Legacies of Race and Racism course with many of our faculty embedding race and racism, the teaching of it within their area of study. We literally, for MLK Day, it's not about me being out there representing MLK Day. We had our students who were leading the charge, along with other faculty and staff, along with the president making a profound statement about what currently exists in our country and what we need to address. It's important that we show unity in LK Day, but I wasn't the one doing it. Mm. It was the community, the Carthage community doing it. I didn't have to represent it. And I think it's extremely important if we want to nurture hope through action, we have to get other people to have that voice. We have to have a variety of people having a voice and taking action, making decisions 
that literally can impact other people's lives in a positive way. So I look at it, hope in the context of my job right now. And it's and that we're part of the Kenosha community. So I'm knowing that students can go out and they're going to be making decisions and changes for the betterment of other people. KCOR has been um, basically nurturing the sense of hope by throwing block parties all last year. And we threw block parties in the problematic areas of Kenosha. Basically, we went and threw the party so the neighbors could start communicating. Because there's been neighbors that live years next to each other, never said hi, goodbye, take the trash mm -hmm. out, the dogs in my yard, nothing. So by us throwing these block parties for the community, we allowed the community to come out. And with the block parties, we gave away food, we gave away prizes that was all donations to k Core. So basically, we received and we gave away. That's the only way you can appreciate something. You have to give it away. You can't just hold on to it. So by us giving away communication, giving away conversation, giving away food, because, you know, food is one of the main things that create a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so by, by us cooking and giving away the food, we had um, the police chief now talking to the community. He's blending in with the community. The community don't even know he's the chief. So we're like, hey, uh, you know this is the police chief, right? And they like, so you know the first hit reaction, they <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 just come on, come on, come on, come on in, talk to them. So by us doing that, we're bridging the gap of division. We're getting rid of that. We're creating that conversation that needs to be had in the community. And by that happening, now you have relationships that are starting to evolve and build. So I feel like by us doing that, we're nurturing the sense of hope. So there's hope in Kenosha. <laughs> um, one last question, uh, just to, to, to go around as we kind of wrap up and finalize. I'm sorry, not one last question, but I want you guys to give one last takeaway individually from, from each one of you guys. And, and hopefully uh, I'll be repeating some of those takeaways because I have a list as well. Uh, so from each one of you guys, 30 seconds or less, what's a takeaway from this conversation that you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, First Minister of Defense, we'll start with you and we'll wrap it around and close it out with the county exec. I basically want our listeners and our viewers to, to know that there are people here that care about you. There are people here that's willing to listen and hear your cries. We want to make sure that you don't feel alone and that you know that you're no longer alone. You were never alone, but now your voice can be heard because we're here to hear you and help if we can. Wow, that was less than 30 seconds. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hancock. Uh, would you repeat that again? <laughs> so what's one takeaway that you want our Kenosha community members to hear from this conversation? I think what we need to hear is that we have a big decade ahead of us, mm -hmm. that we can create the momentum. And because I've seen the cultural conscious consciousness, the awareness of this, and we have so many tools at our disposal. So I believe that we need to understand that we can create that momentum and sustain it as long as we're willing to have authentic communication and have engaged in what uh, the gentleman here just spoke about in terms of getting people to see each other and listen to each other and understand that we all need to work towards a common good for our community. I would agree with uh, what, what's been said already. And I am so inspired by these two young women here mm -hmm. and, and what they've said and how they start their own uh, protests that that's peaceful and got others to join in. Those are the kind of things that we need to highlight. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we need to try to replicate mm -hmm. and how we need to really listen to the voices out there. We give people opportunities to speak and talk, but then we don't listen mm -hmm. and we don't right. take what they say. But I, I would like to believe that, I, I do believe there is hope. I do believe mm -hmm. um, that 
we can get better, but it's going to take all of us to do that. Yeah, it's you. So, uh, you know, I know people are nervous and I know that people are worried about the future. And, and I just think Kenosha is a place that has demonstrated once before in my life uh, how they it can be stronger out of, out of adversity. You know, I, when I first got here, an auto plant was closing. It's not exactly the same thing, but almost everybody in Kenosha I talked to then thought it's over. We're done. This place will never survive this. We'll never make it from here. There's no way to build something again. And I think most people would tell you that the diversity and the challenges that that did made us stronger as a community. And so I, I really challenge people to think about it that same way. There is work to do. You know, there's plenty to be nervous about, but boy, we have done it before and we can do it again. Mayor, to you, what's <laughs> one takeaway that you want the Kenosha community and the viewers to take from this conversation? I think to get out in the community and do something. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's once. I'd hope it'd be, it'd, it'd be routine, but do something that you think is going to have a positive impact on your community or even a community that isn't your own and keep doing it until you see positive change. A lot of them to you. Um, I think I'd love to know um, to just like be open to being uncomfortable. I think um, a lot of change and a lot of prosperity that comes within these like small communities and like getting them open, like more inclusive is just like discomfort. And like, not, it's not even like a bad thing. I think whether that's like between races, between ages, you know, between like different neighborhoods, different streets, you know, I think but like to unify people, you have to be just open. You have to be open and ready to be a little bit uncomfortable. Tony, exact to you. And this this county has been up to challenges, and I think mm -hmm. we just need to pull together more. Mm -hmm. Right. Include people on a task list to get things done, and the things that have been done are educational institutions, by county government. Hold the feet to the fire, for instance, for whoever takes my job to continue those on and not let backsliding occur when it comes to voices of diverse populations being at the table. If I can, um, I want to tell you, ladies, we are extremely proud of you. Mm -hmm. You're fighting the fight, you're standing for what you believe in, continue to do it. Because it takes one. That's it. All it does is take one. And then it can multiply into more. Mm -hmm. And as long as you guys continue to fight, continue to be your cheerleader. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So some key takeaways uh, for me. Again, if you're just joining the show, um, Maybe pull out the notebook or hit the rewind button later. <laughs> <laughs> but the folks that were that joined us tonight uh, really left some gems. And I'm just going to name off uh, about five or six uh, gems that they dropped in this last 90 minutes. One key takeaway, a small group of people like the Equitines can make a difference and an impact through peaceful protests, even when anger is very high. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Another key takeaway, we can heal. We can heal. We can heal our community by getting involved and listening. And I'll add to this one, listening not to respond, Listening not to respond, but listening to help and empower. Have ongoing conversations with people of color and include people of color in decision making and policy development. Work together to define racial equity and what we want to achieve. Another key takeaway. Criminal justice system can connect in positive ways. Again, I'll say that again. The criminal justice systems 
can connect in positive ways with the community by creating relationships with the community. Another key takeaway. I didn't write this one. This is not a shameless plug, but I'll take it. <laughs> Contact our education initiative. Contact Building Our Future to learn more and to work with young children. Sorry. Young people. <laughs> 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 the young adults yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to work with the young adults children to close education gaps become a mentor here's an action educate yourself on your history educate yourself on your history know your history and then acknowledge our history Again, acknowledge our history, or we won't be able to solve our problems and heal. And then the last key takeaway I have from this conversation, what can we do? What can we do? And as one of you guys mentioned, what's something positive I can do that will have a positive impact on my community? Volunteer in our community. Spotlight the positives in our community. Increase diversity in positions of authority. I'm going to add to that too. Increase diversity on your boards. Mm -hmm. If your boards don't look like Kenosha, yeah. <laughs> Increase diversity in positions of authority. Communicate with kindness, because we can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. Wow, you guys really <laughs> dropped <laughs> in. Oh man, uh, again, thank all of you guys for being a part of this panel tonight. Again, this is a courageous conversation, chaos or community. How do we move forward? Um, how do we continue this conversation? If anybody wanted to give any advice to our Kenosha community, and I'm sure other communities are looking at us as well, but how do we continue this conversation to move forward? Anybody want to chime in? How do we continue this conversation to move forward? A listening ear patient here. Be willing to hear, even if it's something you don't want to hear. Be willing to hear the conversation. All conversations don't have to have a reaction, but all conversations must be heard. Anybody else? How do we move forward? <laughs> I said a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think silence is good? Silence is good. Anybody, how do we move forward? Just I, keep going. But I, also, <laughs> but I also think, you know, just like we need coalitions and we need coalitions comprised of people from all walks of life and to establish a framework like the example with building our future and your focus on education and on health disparities and different things like that but to expand the coalitions of people who are willing to support and have a voice to really say this is what we need and this is how we can get there i i honestly think that Moving forward means having diverse voices at the table. It's too often I have seen throughout my career and experience is that the voices are limited. And so how do we engage people? And we talked about this tonight and about going into the communities. How do we reach the voices of the unsung people? 
and how do we bring them into our organizations so we can respond to what they see they need and empower them because most people want to be empowered. They want to feel that they can make a difference, but how do we show them the path forward? Anybody else, lasting words on how we can move forward? We reflect, we reflect. Anybody else before we close it out? Okay. So I'd like to thank all of our viewers. Please go back, listen to it again. Take these gems that, that all of these folks dropped down tonight. Uh, again, this is brought to you by the Coalition for Dismantling Racism. The conversation being titled, Chaos or Community? How do we move forward? Again, I'm Brandon Morris. I'm the manager of community engagement building our future. Thank you for joining us. God bless. Good night.